Thank you, Louis. I love the creativity. And by the way, I want to pinch on that uh, fresh stuff that you have afterwards. Yeah, diet is so important. Um, you know, last year, I think it was last year or the year before, we, we really wanted that year to be a health focus when we also had AGL here. So especially now, we really need to take care of ourselves and really boost our immune systems because uh, anything strange that tries to enter our body, if our immune system is really strong and healthy, we can enjoy many more things uh, than, uh, you know, be sick. All right, well, uh, today is really exciting because we are going to start a series of messages. Uh, let me just get ready, and my team, um, if you can have the PowerPoint up there as well. As you can see, we are going to look at the book of Job. That's the, that's the book we're going to focus on. Next week, I won't be preaching. It will be Andrea. She's he's taking us back into fasting and praying. That would be the focus. But then after that, uh, we have, I think, April 2nd. That's the Genesis coming in. She's sharing God's word. And then again, I will be coming, and I'll be again continuing the series uh, on, on the book of Job. Uh, I'm really happy that young people are here. Thank you so much for joining us to... God bless you. Right. I want you to have a look at this picture uh, we've got uh, right up on the screen. Uh, if we can go to that picture, uh, Apollonia. This shook the world. Uh, just a few weeks ago, one of the hospital uh, maternity uh, ward was hit by Russian uh, army. It, uh, they bombed that place, and apparently that woman... She was badly injured. She was pregnant, and uh, she and her baby, both of them, they died. That really, when we heard that, Rumina and I, we were so sad. What have they done? Why do they deserve that? Why did she have to die? Why that in that maternity ward? had to be hit by the bomb, and basically so many people were injured there. Things like that, they really, really raise this question in our heart and in our mind that why is it sometimes even innocent people, they suffer? I mean, look at the baby that was in her womb. What that baby has done to deserve that? There's another picture I wanted to bring to your attention, if we can go to that. So many people, so many people have died because of COVID. And uh, yes, thank you, Colin. And, and, and it's really sad. I, I don't know if you're taking note of the numbers, but millions have died as a result of COVID. But you are here, and I praise God for you that you made it through this pandemic and still is lingering behind. But it saddens my heart. At home, uh, Rumina and I, when at times we watch this news, it does sadden our heart. But at the same time, it raises this question in our mind, why is it that righteous people have to go through this all as well? I mean, in the Bible, it does say that wicked will suffer, but... If there are good people out there, why do they also have to suffer? The book of Job, that's what we're going to focus on. It gives us a glimpse into how this all operates. It, it shows us, it helps us answer one of these questions. So for the next few weeks, we are going to really jump into this book and not just that, that, uh, you know, many people say that the book of Job is just, it teaches about patience and perseverance. I think that's not doing justice to the book of Job or to his story. I believe the story of Job is the story of us. I also believe that the story of the friends of Job is also the story of us. 
And not just that, the book of Job has a literature that has deep connections with the book of Revelation and then the book of Daniel. I don't hear much of that being preached or shared, but through this series, we are going to jump into this book and we are going to see some of the connections that this book has with apocalyptic or prophetic literature within the Bible. We as Adventists, we really focus on the book of Revelation and book of Daniel, but we haven't preached much about the book of Job. And through this series, I want to show that the book of Job is so relevant today, just as prophetically the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel is relevant for us. So, for next few weeks, I want you to actually, at home, also read through this book and, and spend some time, pray about it, and let God speak to you through His Word because this book has so much to teach us. But looking at the literature or, or the content of the book, I just wanted to tell you that the book is classified as wisdom literature. Or the content in the book is very much poetic. So what scholars have done is they have put together a number of books that are poetic in nature. For example, the book of Psalms, book of Proverbs, Song of Solomon. And they have also put another book which is called uh, Lamentation. And also they have put the book of Job in there as poetic. Or there is so much wisdom in that book. So it is classified as wisdom literature these books. Now, there is one writer, I will, I'll share with you the quote, uh, his name is Timothy J. Johnson, this is what he says, Job should at least be included in the corpus of works that contains literary, can we go to the next slide, Apollonia, literary characteristics common to both wisdom and apocalypse. Alan, can you help her, please? So, the literature that is, uh, or, or the content of the book of Job has characteristics or, or some of the features that actually very much connect to the book of Revelation and Daniel as well. And we will see some of that today. In regards to who wrote the book of Job, well, there are a number of uh, theories out there, and I'll, I'll come to this map uh, shortly, just hold on. Oh, who, who say that the book of Job was written by perhaps Solomon. King Solomon wrote the book. Why they come to that conclusion is because the book is categorized as poetic or is part of the wisdom literature of like Proverbs or Song of Solomon's or Psalms. They thought that, oh, perhaps Solomon is the one who wrote it. Or some people say Ezra, the priest, is the one who wrote the book of Job. Or some other people they call Elihu, one of the friends of Job, he wrote the book of uh, Job. But then there are some other people who say that perhaps David wrote the book, perhaps somebody who is named, who is not named in the book wrote, so someone unnamed author. Well, there are so many theories out there as to who exactly wrote this story in the Bible. Here is what I believe. I personally believe the book was written by Moses. Moses is the one who wrote the book, and I'll share with you why I believe that. But before we do that, we know Moses' life is divided into three big chunks. He spent 40 years in Egypt, and then he spent 40 years in Midian, and then he spent 40 years going back to Egypt and leading his people out of the captivity. So the book of Job perhaps was written by Moses during his 40 years while he was in Midian. And here's the map of, uh, of Midian, where, where really Midian was. If you look at Egypt, that's where Moses ran from during uh, his time when he was in Egypt. That's where he was raised, and then he runs all the way to Midian, and that's where he spent about 40 years looking after the sheep, and that's where he got married, and his father-in-law's name was Jethro. 
So that is the time the book of Job was written. And because in the book of Job, we don't find any mention of Exodus, like when people left Egypt, we don't find that in the book of Job. We also don't find the dividing of the Red Sea in the book of Job. And that tells me that it appears that book of Job was one of the first book that was written in the Bible. Even before the book of Genesis, even before the book of Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers, Deuteronomy. Because in the book of Job, you get to see a completely different picture. If Moses wrote the book of Job, then the book of Job was written before the book of Genesis. That was very interesting for me to discover. And he's writing that during the time while he is in Midian. And no wonder why he must be focusing on the book of Job, because a lot of patience, a lot of perseverance was needed by Moses. He ran away from Egypt. He ran away from the place where he was raised, and he's out there in the desert place where he had to be educated in the school of God that required a lot of patience, that required a lot of perseverance, and that is the time, why not focus on the story of Job that Moses must have heard, and then he penned it down. And that must have offered him a lot of encouragement, a lot of perseverance, and a lot of patience, because the book of Job offers a classic example for that. Let's look at the structure of the book of Job. Uh, well, just in relation to, if you're reading the book of Job, as you open the book of Job, you will see that the first two chapters that record what's actually going on, on, and Job is not aware of that. The first, uh, first two chapters is called prose, prelude, and then you have the dialogue between Job and his friends, and that starts from chapter 3. And after that, what happens? You have cycles of speech. There are three cycles of speech. First cycle of speech is between Job and his friend Eliphaz. So Job had four friends, by the way. Number one friend was Eliphaz. Number two friend was Bildad. And number three friend was Zophar. Can we say this together? Can you say this with me? Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. These were the three friends. And now the book of Job is basically a dialogue between these three friends and Job. And there are three turns each one of them get. So the first cycle of speech is Job. first speech is recorded in chapter 3. And then after that, you have Eliphaz. He's speaking. After Eliphaz finishes, then you have the Job talking again. And then once Job has done, then you have his friend Bildad talking. And then after Bildad has finished, then you have Job again speaking. And once Job has finished, then you've got Zophar speaking. So that is the completion of first cycle. And then the second cycle begins again, or cycle, uh, second turn of speeches begin, and that starts in chapter 12. And that is Job speaks, and then Eliphaz, and then again Job, then Bildad, and then after that Job again, and then you have Zophar. And again, next slide tells us that the, that's the third cycle, where Job's first speech is recorded in chapter 21. And then after that, you've got Eliphaz responding to Job, and then you have Job speaking again, and then you have Bildad. And by the way, in the last cycle, you don't have Zophar speaking. There is another person who makes an entry. His name is Elihu. He is considered to be the youngest man in the group. And he comes and he begins his dialogue with Job as well. And towards the end of this book, there is an other character that makes an entry into the story. And that is none other but God himself. You, as, as you finish the job, we'll go to the next slide. That will show you that towards the end that you have, if we can go to the next slide, Apollonium, uh, go, go to the previous one. You will have, uh, uh, towards the end, as you can see, Job's acknowledgement. Uh, by the way, in chapter 38, God's answer to Job, and then it is called prose postlude. That's where the conclusion of the book is happening, and Job is acknowledging God. Job is praying for his friends. And then you have towards the end Job's restoration. Whatever Job loses, 
God blesses him back with everything again. So that is the overall structure of the book. I hope that helps you. So when next time when you're approaching the book of Job, you can say there are three cycles of speeches between his three friends and Job himself. And the fourth friend, his name is Elihu. Can we name the friends again? First friend is Aliphaz. Second friend is Bildad. And the third friend is Zophar. And the fourth friend, who is the youngest one, his name is Elihu. So there are five characters in the book of Job. And then there are some other unnamed characters like the, his children and his wife. They are also mentioned in the book of Job. But just to name the main characters, one is Job himself, then his four friends, and then God himself. That's where the story moves around in the book of Job. Let's jump into this book now. Let's start with the verse 1. Can we go to that one, please? Verse 1 is, there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Job lived in Uz. Now, it's important for us to know where is Uz, like geographically. Uh, well, there are a number of uh, proposals that are, that are put forward, and I do have a map that I'll show you soon, but there are a few, few words from different scholars. Uh, number one is, uh, his name is Siegfried. He, he is uh, the writer of one of the commentary uh, or editor, I could call he says that while Uz cannot definitely be identified with any non-locality, it's very difficult to actually locate where Uz was, but he suggests that it seems to have been laid near the Syrian desert or northern Arabia and not far from Eden. So you're talking very much towards Middle Eastern place, okay? We can go to the next one, and there is another person who says his name is James. He tells us that in Lamentation, the book of Lamentation, four, chapter 4, verse 21, it says, Uz seems to be virtually equated with Edom. This may be the most promising information because the geographic identification provided by Job's counselors, which is Aliphaz, Zophar, Bildad, these, these are called counselors of Job, Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite also point towards Adam. So here's the map I've got. I hope that's the one. It's very small. You can't really see, but, but you will see that Edom is right close to Midian. Can you say that? And no wonder somehow the news must have reached Moses. Moses must have heard the story of Job because jo uh, Moses spent a lot of time in the desert of Midian, somewhere there, and then as you go up, you will see Edom there. So the story takes place somewhere there, the story of Job. Job lived in that place. So what's the meaning of his name? If you really look at the original language, you'll find the, the meaning of Job is someone who's attacked, someone who, who, who has enemy. And you can see clearly that the name of Job gives clear message that he seems to be someone who is attacked by another person. All right, there are some uh, archaeological evidences as well as to whether the man named Job actually existed historically, because there are many people out there who, who think that actually Job is a man-made tale or man-made story that never happened. Is it just there to, to tell us something good or to help us teach, uh, teach us patience and perseverance? So historically or uh, archaeologically, there is evidence as well. Uh, these were some of the letters or, or, or tablets that, were, that are inscribed with cuneiform, and they were discovered in Tel El Amarna. That was the short-lived capital of ancient Egypt, and the name Job, or Ayob, or Ayab, is mentioned on one of those tablets. And they come from 14th century BC. The Exodus, or Israelites, when they were captive in Egypt, they left Egypt somewhere around 14th century BC as well. And that's the time when these tablets were written, and it appears that the story of Job was very familiar to the Egyptians as well. 
to that place as many people actually just for your information in Islam Muslims they follow the book called Quran in Quran you also have the story of Job that is recorded there so that tells us that actually the story about Job or the man named Job existed in history and there are other books also they mention the name and uh, uh, name of job as well go to the book of ezekiel ezekiel talks about job he says even if these three men while he was giving the message of judgment he is telling that even if these three men noah daniel and job were in the city or uh, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness the city won't be spared or other people won't be spared if they were in the city they will only spare themselves because of their righteousness in other words because of their righteousness other people won't be saved the point is that ezekiel also knew about job okay let's go to another one his name is james and that is in the new testament after thousands of years james chapter 5 verse 11 he mentions his name as well he says indeed we count them blessed who endure you have heard of the perseverance of job and seen the end intended by the lord that the lord is very compassionate and merciful so the book of james in the new testament also knew about job so the story was already there it never died historically job existed he lived like any other ordinary man now just looking at his character we have re read the verse 1 in first verse there are four words mentioned about this man and i wish i wish we could have those characteristics in our life number one characteristic is mentioned that he is blameless when you look at the original word that is tam this word does not necessarily imply that he was perfect or sinless but it means simply that he was sincere he was honest man because there is only one man who ever existed who was perfect and sinless and that's jesus there is no one else who ever lived who was sinless so job was someone who was blameless honest and sincere person and then again we have he was upright if you look at the original word that's yashar yashar means he was straight it's like you have a stick which is very straight and leveled he was a straight person in other words he was just and he was right person and then the third characteristics we find about job is that he feared god in the bible when you say somebody he, is, he he feared god it means that he was loyal to god he devoted to god he didn't worship any other person he didn't just leave god when things were bad he devoted his life he was loyal till death to God and then the fourth characteristic about this man we find is that he shunned evil now this word when you look at in the original language it, it it becomes really interesting because when you say he shunned evil that doesn't mean that he just ignored evil that means that if he is going let's say like this and if there is bad thing right there in his life he took a turn and he went this way that's what it means that he shunned evil if he's going in a bad direction he saw that that's not the right way to go he turned around and he went back this is one of his characteristics as, as, as well so there are four things that make job he's blameless he is upright he feared god he shunned evil oh wow I wish I can have those characteristics and no wonder devil didn't like him Satan didn't like him I wish I can be blameless I wish I can be upright I wish I can fear God the way Job did I wish I can shun evil the way Job did I can tell you evil wickedness or sinfulness is very attractive lustfulness is very attractive of sinful nature pulls us into something that is not right 
And Job was someone, if he was pulled towards lustful desires or something that is not right, he would take a turn and go back. He shunned evil. Those four words, they're not just the repetition that Job is a good man. Actually, when you look at those first, they complete Job. They complete his character. If you were to paint a picture of Job, these four words, they could come together and give you that's who Job is. Right, let's look at his family, all right? He had seven sons and three daughters, by the way, in the Bible, when you look at uh, these numbers, number seven and number three, they are actually prophetic numbers as well. They are, they, are, they are numbers that are repeated often in the Bible, and they imply perfection. Number seven is perfect number, and number three also is considered as perfect number because of Trinity, right? Father, Son, and God. So here, what is presented through verse is that the life that Joe was having was almost like perfect life. He had seven sons, he had seven, uh, three daughters, and then he is upright, blameless, uh, just righteous man. His wealth. I want us to focus on his wealth. Let's go to the slides, please. Uh, if you look at his wealth, man, uh, he had 7,000 sheep. Count that. 7,000 sheep. Uh, I don't know. Uh, any rich farmer here in New Zealand would have 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. And uh, sheep and goats provided food and clothing for, for the people at that time. Then he had 3,000 camels. And then you've got 500 yoke of oxen that helped plowing the fields. Then you have 500 female donkeys that helped with usual domestic uh, chores. And a very large household, many servants who performed the labor and the task that helped Job to survive or live. So it appears to me Job wasn't just an ordinary man. This man was the greatest of all the people of the East. I want us to focus on that word for a, for a while. The people of the East. By the way, just before we go there, I just wanted to share with you that Job seems to be coming from the time of Abraham. When you look at the wealth of Abraham, when you look at the wealth of Lot, you'll see that they had a lot of animals and they had many servants. And that's how Job is also portrayed to us. So it appears that Job lived during some time during 19th century to 17th century BC or 7, uh, 1700 BC. So 1900 to 1700 BC. Just to put things into perspective, Exodus, Israelites, they left Egypt 1400 BC, somewhere close to that. So the story of Job is before that. Okay, now let's, let's look at uh, a few more things. Look, now, he is the greatest among all the people of the East. Why is it that he is greatest among all the people of the East, whereas God promises blessings to Abraham? You remember God made a promise and covenant with Abraham, and if Job lived during the time of Abraham, Job is out of the people with whom the covenant was made. That's, that's, that's strange, isn't it? Well, I want to take you, to few uh, take you through a few texts just to share with you that our God is compassionate, wonderful, kind, just, and fair God. Here's the text that I want you to take note of. Uh, Genesis chapter 21, verses 17 to 18. You know that Abraham married Hagar, right? Sarah asked Abraham to marry Hagar because they weren't having a child, so Sarah wanted Hagar to marry or sleep with Abraham so they could have a child, and she thought that God was going to fulfill the promise through her son or through, Ish, uh, through Hagar's son. So, well, later on you find that Abraham and Hagar, they slept together, and then you have a child whose name was Ishmael, and then later on Sarah also got a child whose name was Isaac. And as soon as Sarah got Isaac, what happened? She didn't like Hagar and Ishmael to be around. So she wanted Ishmael and Hagar to go away. And God didn't abandon Hagar and Ishmael. And this is when God is talking to them. It says in verse 17 of chapter 21 of the book of Genesis, And God heard the voice of the lad. And who is this lad? Ishmael. 
Then the angel of the God called to Hagar and out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. So God didn't only promise to Isaac that through Isaac you will have Jacob and through Jacob you are going to have 12 tribes. God is also promising to Ishmael. God is also promising to Hagar that your son Ishmael who is also the son of Abraham, he will also be blessed and I'll turn him into a great nation. Let's go to the next text. And that text tells us that Ishmael actually did become a great nation. And it says here in chapter 25 of Genesis, verses 13 to 15, and these were the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations. You need to count that on your fingers. The firstborn of Ishmael was Nebioth, then Kedar, Adbil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hada, Tema, Jetur, Napish, and Kedema. How many? Some are saying 12, some are saying 10. It seems like it's 12, but I, I didn't count that anyways. The point is that God did bless Ishmael as well. So you have tribes coming out of Ishmael, and then you have tribes coming out of Isaac. And by the way, Muslims believe they are descendants of Ishmael. And then Jewish people believe they are descendants of Isaac. Why I'm coming there is not that Job is the descendant of Ishmael. But Job lived in the east. That's where Ishmael and all the sons and tribes, they moved and they lived there. Right? So this is where Job was, and he was one of the greatest men. Okay, let's go back to Job. We're going to go back and let's look at uh, verses 4 to 5 quickly. It says here, and his sons would go and feast in their houses. And each, uh, this is very interesting. By the way, here is the first time you can see parting in the Bible. They are parting, man. They are enjoying their life. You know, young people they love parting. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Parting is great. You you have fun. And here you've got seven sons. They've got a rich dad, who's got. You know, 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels. And think about a lot of business is going on because camels, they were used for business as well. And his sons would go and feast in the houses and each on his appointed day and would send and invite the three sisters. So they, there is a lot of unity among the siblings. They love each other. And they are inviting the sisters and they would eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run had run their course, then that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now, through these verses, we find Job is not just an ordinary father. Job is someone who appears to be the high priest for the family. Man, that, when I read that, I, that really told me off. Because as a father, I have a huge responsibility in the house. He's the one who's creating that culture. Yes, they are having partying. They're, they're partying, they're enjoying their life. But then Job is very much concerned. And he wants to make sure that even if they have sinned unintentionally, subconsciously or they have they're not aware of that they have done something wrong job offered sacrifice for them in other words job prayed for his children not just that job created that culture and environment in the house i'm sure his sons and daughters they could see that job is praying for them they could see that job is offering sacrifice on their behalf to the Lord and praying for their well-being. I wish our children could see us on our knees when we are praying for them. I wish our children could see our dedication, loyalty, and commitment to God because if we are committed, if we are loyal, if we obey the Lord, our children will do the same. I mean, there is nothing strong, there, there is no stronger message for our children 
for our young people than us being committed and showing that, hey, we are sincere, we are serious about God. If we aren't, how can we even expect that they will? And I think Job is really telling us here that he was such a dedicated person who was concerned about the well-being of his children. We are almost ending our today's uh, message, so just a few, few more minutes, give me, and then uh, we will finish. Okay, let's look at verses 6 to 12, and that is when the sad bit begins. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Ooh, how can Satan be among the sons of God? That's the question which I often get. And the Lord said to Satan, from where you, do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going, and, uh, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, oh, as usual, you know, there is something about negative people. No matter how much good you do, they'll always find something bad in your good. They'll always find something negative, no matter how hard you're trying to do, uh, you're trying to be positive. And right here, there's so much good about Job, but Satan has a something very interesting here. What does Satan do? He says, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? <laughs> Satan straight away, he figures out, all right, I can't really say anything wrong about Job because he's upright, he's blameless, he, he's just, he's honest, he's a sincere man who is loving the Lord and he's devoted to Him. So there's only one thing that I can say is and I can put blame back on God. I can say that, oh, He fears you because you've got something going there. All right, so let's read what he says. So he says, have you not made a hedge around Him? Woo! So Satan is blaming God and he's saying that, well, he follows you, he obeys you, he loves you because you've got your hatch around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you on your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay hand on his person. So Satan went out. He didn't even delay, man. He said, All right, I'm back in business. So straight away, as soon as God says, All right, if you think that my man, my friend Job, loves me, he's devoted to me, he's loyal to me, it's just because I've got my hedge of protection around him, or just because I have blessed him, he's prospering, and you think that he's doing all of that because I've got my protection around him, here you go, I'll take this protection away. You go in, and let's see what happens. And devil, straight away, as you can see, and the Lord said to Satan, and behold, all that he, is, he has is in your power, and only do not lay a hand on this person. So Satan went out, shoo, he goes out straight away, out of the presence of the Lord, and the rest you can see in the book of uh, Job, we will see in that next story. But today, I just want to answer one question, and then we'll wrap our, our message for today. How can Satan be in the middle of sons of God? It's a very important question. If, when we go back to the book of Isaiah, look at Isaiah chapter 14, we find in Isaiah chapter 14, let's go to that slide, it says here that how you have fallen from heaven. O day star, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the ground, O destroyer of nations. You said in your heart, I'll ascend to the heavens, I'll raise my throne above the stars of God, I'll sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north, I'll ascend above the tops of the clouds, I'll make myself like the most high. You know that. That's when the sin started in heaven. And then as you go to Revelation chapter 12, this is what we find in Revelation chapter 12. The first war takes place in 
verse 7, it says, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that's how he was cast out of heaven. And when we go bo- back to the book of Job, we find that he's a miss. He is with the sons of God. Well, let's see what the Bible teaches us. or what, how, how, Well, then there is another example we can find in the book of Daniel. You remember the time when Daniel is praying for his people and he believes the time has come for his people to go back to their home country. And God answered straight away. Angel came from Haman straight away, but something happened. As you go to Daniel chapter 10, verses 10 to 14, it says, Suddenly a hand touched me, angel touched Daniel, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man, greatly beloved, understand the words that I am going to speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you while he was speaking this word to me. I stood trembling. Then he said to me, One of the angels said to Daniel, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day when you started praying or you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia restored me 21 days. And that's how I got delayed because evil power was there to block me. I straight away, first day when Daniel, you started praying, God heard your prayer, God sent me, and I was, as I was flying, as I was coming out to answer your prayer, right in the middle, evil power came, and we fought. That power didn't let me come to you. And then another angel was sent, or actually in the Bible it says Michael came to help, and then I am able to now come to answer your prayer. I was wondering where, where did this battle take place between two angels or, or two powers? Was it in heaven or was it outside heaven? Was it somewhere in the air? Was it somewhere in the sky? Where did this battle take place? Same question can be asked for where did this meeting take place? The meeting between God and other angels or sons of God. And we find that Satan is also with them as well. Well, here is the interesting bit. If you haven't heard anything, don't miss this one because that you will remember because this is quite interesting. As I was reading uh, from uh, one of the writers, his na- her name is Ellen White. This is what she writes in the story of redemption. You need to read this. Don't miss this one because this is really important. It said this great change of position is she's talking about devil, about Satan. This great of change of position had not increased his love for God. He hated God, nor for his wise and his just law. When Satan became fully convinced that there was no possibility of his being reinstated in the favor of God, he manifested his malice with increased hatred and fiery vehemence. God knew that such determined rebellion would not remain inactive. Satan would invent. And this is where I want you to pay attention, please. Here, this is very important. It says, Satan would invent means to annoy the heavenly angels and show contempt for his authority. Next slide, please. As he could not gain admission within the gates of heaven, because he is cast out of heaven, he could not go inside heaven, he would wait just at the entrance to taunt the angels and seek contentions with them as they went in and out. In other words, he's sitting at the gate of heaven, and as the angels are going in and out, as they are helping out and answering the prayers of people, this guy, he sits at the gate and he's showing contempt and malice towards those angels. He would seek to destroy the happiness of Adam and Eve. He would endeavor to incite them to rebellion. There is another quotation I wanted to bring to your attention. Let's go to that one. His name is Stephen Nelson Huskell. This is what he writes. He says, although Satan and his angels had been cast from heaven, they still could appear in the councils of the Lord at the gate of heaven. Uh Uh-huh. 
So the meeting that is mentioned in the book of Job, I'm pretty sure didn't take place in heaven, but perhaps at the gate of heaven, outside heaven. Right. I'll tell you an interesting thing. In the Bible, there are many things that happen at the gate. Here's another other, other writer. This is what he writes. Uh, his name is Daniel Ephris. Uh, in one of the journals, he writes, The gate complex of an ancient Israelite city was more than a mere passage into the town. He says, or a defensive military structure. It was the civic forum, the heart of the city, the open spaces of the gate complex, hummed with activity. The town's elders oversee legal procedures. Kings publicly sat and looked cons uh, to counsel, and the prophets proclaimed their messages of doom. Town people came and went, brought and so bought and sold, worshipped. Their deities were tried and executed. Indeed, most of town's civic life was centered on the town gate complex. And I was wondering if ancient in, in, in near in ancient Near Eastern place or in Arabia or Middle Eastern place, gates were very important place. Where did this concept come from? Could it be it was? From heaven. That's where at the gate council took place, as we have discovered. Well, that's something that we can discuss. Uh, we don't really have biblical uh, passages there that we can, we can say, but this is just what I'm thinking that could be a possibility. Let's go, uh, go to the next slide. And because of the prominence of gates within the culture, they took on additional significance. Gates were symbolic of royalty and independence of community, well being, and so forth. As the time went, and this is where we'll stop, things that happened at the gate, it took on spiritual meaning as well, as is recorded in the book of Genesis. You know the story of Cain and Abel? And while God is talking to Cain, let's go to the next slide, please. And this is what God is telling Cain. If you do well, Cain, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you but you should rule over it the concept of things happening at the gate consuls happening at the gate and then in the middle eastern culture how important it was you remember the story of ruth and boaz that happens at the gate as well right and then god is telling cain that make sure you guard your gate because through your eyes, through your mind, that's where how sin enters. And uh, my friends, this is where we're going to just pause. This is not the end, because this story is going to continue. It's a fascinating book. And today was very much to, to build the foundation upon which we're going to lay a little bit more, because we haven't re really even finished the first chapter. Okay, we've got the whole book to navigate through. Okay, so may God bless you as you guard the door of your heart. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we cannot do it ourselves. We can't do it with our strength. God can help us. He's our strength. Mm -hmm. Christ can help us. Just as we see in the book of Job, as we will navigate through the story, you will find that with God, Job was strong, even if he was suffering. We are living through very difficult times, but there is hope for us through God himself. When God is with us, nothing can be against us. When God is with us, we can navigate through difficult times. We can guard the doors of our heart and our mind and our eyes and be in tune with the mighty one. Thank you so much. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, as uh, you blessed us uh, to study this book. May you please be with us as we journey through and learn a little bit more about it and try to answer some of the questions and, and also learn from this man. Also, please help us to guard our, our hearts and minds and eyes so that we can be in tune with you and be in, in a strong relationship with you. Help us to trust in you in the times when we can't see too far. Help us to trust in you and love you in uncertain times. For we pray in Jesus' name.